books and talks teach something of the outer outward aspect of the inward there is an inward aspect and the outward these books and talks of the sheikhs teach you something of the outward aspect of the inward that's why these are very important and relevant in the process of transformation there is a beautiful parable an exchange between sufi mystic simab and the noble man mulaka these kind of parables are normally preserved as the oral transmission and that is the best way to keep them as oral transmission but in recent years i have tried to put those parables in the form of books so that it can be made available along with commentary parables of naqshbandi sheikhs one day it happened the noble man mulaqab asked sheikh sima tell me something of your philosophy so that i can understand the mystic replied you cannot understand unless you experience mulaqab replied i do not have to understand key to know whether it is bad or not this is a logic i do not need to understand cake to know whether it is bad mystic responded if you are looking at good fish and you think it is a bad cake you need to understand less and to understand it better more than you need anything else mulaka then why do you not abandon the books and talks if experience is of utmost necessity it is a very logic when you look at the reply of the noble man it is all soaked in logic mystic said because the outward is conducted to the inward they are two sides of the same coin books will teach you something of the outward aspect of the inward and so will the talks they are an intense aspect of tawajjuh the transmission of energy field it prepares you to understand the deeper messages which cannot be understood by way of logic or word to word there is an entire science of etymology all the names that are used in various scriptures have a great significance in their names sometimes when we ask what name should be given to the child we use different techniques a hindu priest will look into his scriptural mathematical books known as patra and he will give you the first letter from which the name should begin then the choice is yours in sikh tradition in islamic tradition in christianity everywhere that is the we when master initiates a seeker he gives a name this name is not necessary but this name symbolizes the potentiality the hidden potentiality of which the seeker is unaware that is given and then the purpose is that you are 
now on the path of complete discontinuity with all that past the name the conditioning all kinds of layers there is a complete discontinuity you are exploring what your inner potentials are this is what happens when a master gives a bath or initiates bath is the word used in islamic tradition in hindu tradition the word diksha is used initiation is the word that is easy to understand and in christianity we call it baptism it is an important process books and talks will teach you something of the outer aspect of the in without them you will make no progress when you sit down in the company of the sheikh first you sit down there is two ways one the maraqaba begins first then the talk relates to the inner state that has happened at the time of maraqaba and when the talks are the way of meditation these sometimes relate to many questions that lurk behind the surface of many seekers they need not ask and when you come the different configuration of the seekers come immediately a mean a statistical mean comes in front is revealed to the sheikh and he chooses a subject to speak on that will almost help every seeker who are present at the moment and those who are not because the message of the sheikh is beyond time and space for all those who are available to it and also to those who are not at this when he said without books and talks seekers will not make any progress real progress along the path mulakab said why should we not be able to do so without books why we can't stay without books mystics said for the same reason that you cannot think without words thinking for thinking words are necessary you have been reared on books your mind is so altered by books and talks by hearing and not speaking that the inward can only speak to you through the outward whatever you pretend you can perceive mulaka replied does it apply to everyone mystic said it applies to whom it applies it applies ever all to those who think it does not apply to them this applies to everyone just as you cannot think without words you have been reared on books your mind is so altered by books and talks by hearing and speaking that the inward can only speak to you through the outward whatever you pretend you can perceive one of the best way of reading a book is reading it a little loud and if you are familiar with the style of the author if you have heard him you can visualize that and try to read the book a little louder it will create a different kind of ambience and bring a different kind of understanding to you 
than reading it silently. This is a parable, a saying, but it is a Sufi way of teaching, and this is called parable. Sufism is an alchemy. It is the science that seeks to transform baser into precious, lead into gold, the lower into the higher, the outer into inner. It is the science to transform the world into God. Remember, Sufism is not a philosophy. And in fact, anything that has to, any science, any path, any way that has to do something with the inner is not a philosophy. It does not believe in speculations. It believes in experience. It does not believe in logical thinking. It believes in experimentation. Only experiment decides what is true. Nothing else can be decisive. Only when you know, do you know. There is no other way to know. And this is the way of a scientist. He makes a hypothesis, works on that, and arrives at certain results. Sufism does not trust if you want to drop all kind of beliefs because they will be barrier to knowing. A belief is a pseudo kind of knowing. Really, do, You really do not know, but you believe. Because you have believed so long, you start feeling as if you know. We know we see through eyes. For millennium we have been taught that we see through eyes. But if that thinking, that way is changed, you can see in other ways also. All your beliefs have to be taken away from you if you have to move inward. You have to be left in ignorance and ignorance is the door to innocence, is the gateway. Only from there the process of experimentation is possible. Science presupposes nothing, no a priori conclusion. There is no presupposition at all. Science starts with a blank mind. So does a Sufi starts with a blank mind. All these talks techniques of meditation, zikr, all that we do is necessary to remove the conditionings and bring your mind to the level of blankness. There are three things you will have to understand deeply. The first is art. Art does not bother at all about the object. It has its own projections. Art uses the object as a screen on which to project the subjectivity. It projects subjectivity on the object. When you see a woman's face or child's face or a flower, art is not concerned with the subjective Art is not concerned with the objective, with what is there. Art is concerned with what you make out of it, what you project onto it. Beauty is not the part of the object. It is your dream that you bring to the object. Then the object looks beautiful. You, they beautiful flower or the face is in front of you, what you project onto it is the way of the art. Art invents, it does not discover. 
It is not interested in any discovery. It is inventive. It is imaginative. It is projective. That is the basic meaning of the word poet. The original root comes from potes, means one who creates, art is creative. But what can you create? Whatsoever you create will be your mind's projection. Art creates beauty. Science is not creative in that sense. Science is discovery. It discovers whatsoever is there. Science only uncovers it. It does not invent. It has no idea to project onto the object. Science is objective. Art is subjective. Subjective means you are projecting your subjectivity onto the object. I had given you a couple times an example. There was a beautiful place between the hills. It was a waterfall, a beautiful scenery. Three people went to look at that. First was an architect. He has a mind. There is, there are two hills and between them a waterfall, a beautiful scenery. And then waterfall converts into a small rivulet. He says, what a beautiful example of nature's architect. Because his mind is that of an architect. He projects his mind on the object. Next was a poet. What a beautiful example of nature's beauty. It appears beauty has converged at one place. He was a poet. He creates, he projects his imagination onto that. Seeing that what comes to his mind is his creativity. Third was a politician. And they are of the least intelligence. What a criminal waste of nature's energy and resources. Had it been in my constituency, I would have won the election. This is the way we project things. But science does not do. Science is objective. Art is subjective. With art, you have some projections some ideas as a requirement. Before you come to the rose flower, you have come with some dreams in your mind. You have to nourish your dreams. When those dreams are overflowing, they will overflow onto the rose flower. They will surround the rose flower with a glory, with an aura, and you will see something which is not there. You will see something which is really inside you and is only reflected from outside back to you. Art is a dream. It's a dream stuff. Science is objective. The basic requirement of science is to go nude, naked, to go without any prejudice, without any idea of what the case is, just to be there, impartial, objective, with no thoughts in the mind. Only then you can watch whatsoever is there. Reality reveals itself if you can be a witness. Science is a way of witness. That's why all that relates to the inner development is a witness. You are entering into that realm without any prejudice, just as a witness. Buddha's whole emphasis was witnessing. A pure witnessing is what science is. And then there is 
philosophy art at least projects on to something outside science does not project at all it allows the outside to reveal its truth to you and philosophy it is your pure subjectivity it does not bother about the screen art at least bothers about the screen the object the screen has to be there then it can project philosophy is pure speculation you close your eyes and you can go into your thoughts and you can go on and on forever it is an endless process procession of thoughts philosophy is pure subjectivity science is pure objectivity and art is just in between the two a little of philosophy and a little of science a little of objectivity and a little of subjectivity art is a mixture religion can be of three types it can either be a philosophic or it can be artistic or it can be scientific sufism zen buddhism all that is authentic belongs to the third category that is scientific it believes in experiment in experience it does not believe in belief system it trusts only the truth that is already there only you have to uncover it. and that is the only way of moving inward to start with sufism says you have to prepare yourself so that no prejudice no conditioning comes between you and the truth the journey starts with dropping the belief systems theories philosophies and systems it is like you are entering into honeymoon you have to drop all that is outward only then you can reach to the inner precinct where the process of honeymooning can begin only when you are empty of all thoughts your eyes are ready and receptive then you can see with prejudice and belief system covering your eyes you cannot see the reality when we envision something remember i had spoken sometimes ago on al ghazali's seven valleys the seventh when one reaches the seventh valley where he gets the experience of creation and dissolution depending on your belief system you experience the existence in the same way when someone says that this place is a boat of prophets and he happens to come from a particular system he will only reveal the names that are related to that system and to remove that kind of condition the masters refuse to explain the name of names in any way it happened there is a place in india some of you must have visited that near a little far away from roza sharif it is called the shrine of nine prophets one of the sheikh hazrat mujaddid alif sani razi allah taala unu used to pass there and you used to hear the voice you have the eyes to see and yet still you do not see 
he went and he meditated when he was asked and he said this is the resting place of nine prophets the shrines are much longer and bigger than the normal shrines when his chief disciple as of khwaja mohammad masoom inquired the names he said i know the names but i will not, i am not asked to reveal the names a prophet does not have a name you can identify but the real identification of a sheikh of a prophet is his awareness a man is recognized by his awareness the name is the outer covering it may deceive you if your name happens to come from a islamic tradition or a hindu tradition or any other tradition it will give a preach to his to the other and belief system will come into it master is recognized by his awareness by his deep understanding by his inward growth so is the case with the seeker the effort of the master is that the seeker must be recognized by his awareness when you are empty of your own thoughts you are ready to receive and see the state in which human beings ordinarily exist is called as nafs by sufis you are engrossed in humus humus means soil the senses the sense organs they are humus they are nafs we are all engrossed into it the sum total of this results in ego sense and life is a balance between light how does the light fall and moves you your humus the body can take you to a bath to a temple to a church to a mosque and there you will spend your wealth money and where the body goes the money goes and then comes the mind when your feet take you to the bar you spend the money you will get a bar company if you come if your legs feet take you to the company of a sheikh your resources are spent there you will develop a different kind of mind as long as your movement is guided by the senses it is known as nafs the word nafs means desire nature everybody is lost into the desire nature what hindus call as vasanas and buddhist call as tanha the desire to have more the desire to possess the desire to be powerful the desire to be this or that you have to fulfill these desires nafs and because of these desires you cannot see the truth if you are so much full of lust everywhere you see things related to lust whosoever you see you will find you will seek your spouse in that person your desires go overcrowding your consciousness and if the consciousness is too much overcrowded by desires there is no possibility of seeing the truth when you are full of lust you start seeing things according to your lust when you are full of desires you start projecting 
you start seeing things which are not there according to your desire you start coloring the things one day just go to the marketplace well fed satiated with your food go and have a small stroll on the road and another day you go on the same road after fasting and you will be surprised it is not the same street when you are satiated you will see certain things on the same street when you are hungry you will see a totally different things when you are on a fast hungry you will see restaurants hotels and things like that you will go on missing the shoe stores the computer stores and other things when you are well fed you will not see the restaurants the hotels at all you may not have any idea whether they exist there or not you constantly choose according to your desires when you are full of sexuality you will see women if you are a man or if you are a woman you will see men when sexuality differs you stop seeing men and women you stop dividing that way you it simply does not matter it is pointless the first thing that you see in the other is whether he is a man or a woman have you washed you never forget it you can forget everything you can forget the name of the person the face of the person but you never forget whether the person is man or woman why have you ever forgotten that about anybody have you ever wondered whether he is man or woman i knew him 20 years ago i do not remember his name i do not remember his face i do not remember anything about him but have you ever wondered whether he is a man or a woman no that you remember that goes deep into you and it is because of nafs the desire nature the first thing you look into is whether the person is man or woman that is how it goes on when you do not have nafs you do not look into another sexuality it does not matter it does not matter at all you are not concerned with the form of the body whether he has a female body or a male body you do not see it that way once nafs has disappeared once desire nature has disappeared the other is a person pure person maleness and femaleness are re- irrelevant facts who bothers whether those are the most otherwise those are the most pertinent and relevant facts the first thing that you see in the other is the reflection of your nafs if you are a woman you will see the manness in him if you are a man then you will see the womanness in him sufi say nafs is the state where man exists and through nafs there is no possibility of seeing god because nafs can only see sexuality money power nafs is blind to god unless you drop nafs you will not reach to the inner sanctum that god is god is everywhere only god exist all is god and nothing else but you will not see god 
to see God, nafs has to be dropped. Why does nafs become a barrier? What exactly nafs is? Nafs is neurotic hunger which cannot be satisfied. That is what is neurotic. That is why it is neurotic. Because there is no way to fulfill it. The more you fulfill it, the more it grows. Nafs is a constant hankering to have more of whatsoever. If you have money, you want to have more money. If you have a beautiful woman, you want to have more beautiful woman. If you have power, you want to have more. Always it seeks more and more. Now, this more cannot be satisfied. It continuously goes on increasing. In the very nature of things, the desire is for more and it cannot be satisfied. Because whatsoever you have, your desire remains there. You have one dollar, you want to have another fifty cents. When you have one dollar and fifty cents, you need another fifty cents to make two dollars. So you can exchange your four quarters for a dollar and you have two single dollars. When you have five single dollars, you want to convert into a five dollar bill and so on and so forth. The desired nature, nafs is like a horizon. It always looks as if it is just there, maybe a few miles away. If you rush, you can reach it. Within a few hours, you can reach, but you will never reach it. After two hours, when you look, you will find that it has again receded back and the distance is the same. This goes on. That is why all the religions have called this desired nature the source of all kind of mirages and illusions. Hindus call it as Maya that appears to have existed there but it does not exist in reality. It is an illusion, an illusionary line. There the horizon. Horizon does not exist because the earth and heaven never meet anywhere. And the earth is round. It just appears that somewhere the earth and the sky are meeting just yonder there. And it seems so close that it seems worthwhile to try. It remains always so close and always so distant. Between you and the horizon, the distant, uh, distance is constant. It is the same distance. Desire for more cannot be satisfied. And because the desire for more cannot be satisfied, you cannot see that which is. You always hanker for that which is not. So your mind is somewhere else and you cannot see that which is very obvious and surrounds you. You see the horizon. You do not see yourself. You see the distance. You do not see the close by and God is your neighbor. God is really inside you. You are God. But that is very close. So close. <coughs> that is very close. And you do not have any time or energy to look for the close. You will have time and energy only when your desire for the distance has disappeared.